morning, everyone. If you can hear my voice, raise your hand. All right, great. Please come and have a seat so we can get things started. If you're confused about where you are to go, look at your name tag. It will tell you your table number. Thank you for coming this direction. You have another 60 seconds to find your seat. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Raft Annual Dinner, Unlocking Innovation. Thank you for taking your seats. On behalf of the Board of Directors of RAFT and the staff, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight. Uh, my name is Andrea Whitaker. I am on the Board of Directors at RAFT. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to the mission of RAFT, walk you through the agenda, and introduce our CEO, Granger Marber. 
So, uh, again, my name is Andrea Whitaker. I am Director of Teacher Performance Assessment at the Stanford Center for Assessment, Learning, and Equity. And I have been on the RAF board for about four and a half years. And I joined mainly because of RAF's mission. And uh, the, board, the board had a few uh, retreats a while ago, and we, we uh, came up with a few taglines for Raft. And my favorite one is inspiring learning. Because inspiring can be used as both a verb and an adjective. So we can, you can say that Raft is inspiring learning or inspiring learning. You can think about it in two different ways, as both a verb and an adjective. Uh, and that's because our mission is to provide a place for educators to learn and to learn how to engage their students in exploring concepts and using stuff, good stuff, to help their students learn how to use their minds well to solve problems in math, science, and other fields. So tonight, uh, for our agenda, you're going to hear from our new CEO. You're going to honor an outstanding teacher. We are going to have a wonderful talk uh, from a TED Talk presenter um, who's also a teacher. Um, we're going to tap into uh, your curiosity and innovation with some fun, hands-on activities uh, as a team at your table. Uh, and we're going to close with some opportunities to get involved with RAFT. So before we go much further um, with introducing Granger, I did want to introduce two special guests tonight. Uh, Kansen Chu, who is San Jose uh, City Council, District 4. Is Kansen here? Can he stand and wave? Maybe he's stuck in that awful traffic out there. But we'll, we'll acknowledge Kansen uh, a little bit later. And I do know that Mary Mabin from uh, a Congressman Mike Honda's office is here and she's district director for, for Mike Honda's office. So is, uh, Mary, can you give us a wave? Sorry, there she is. Hi, Mary. Okay, so uh, now I would introduce, like to introduce Granger Marburg, uh, who we would like to welcome as our new CEO. He's been with us for five months. He brings to Raft multiple perspectives. He's been a business leader and consultant. He's an educator, including uh, a stint in the Peace Corps in Micronesia. He's a community organizer, a nonprofit leader, a parent, and our new CEO. So welcome, Granger. That was short and sweet. I like that. All right, so welcome. Thank you also for uh, settling in so quickly. Um, there are a, a lot of people, a lot of companies that have um, supported this event tonight. And you've been watching, well, now it's me on the screen, but before there are all the names, uh, thank you. I, I, I want to, in particular, uh, call out HP as our lead sponsor. So thank you, HP. Um, and also, for those of you who are familiar with Raft, you'll know that we have what we call the star wall, which is this yellow wall with all the lights on it and stars. And basically, it's a wall of fame, because anyone who's on that wall um, has gifted this organization at least 25000 or more. And I am very pleased to say that tonight we have uh, a number of new names on our star wall. Uh, we have, and could you hold the applause for six names or seven names, Nigel and Pamela Ball, Altera uh, Corporation, Hitachi, uh, McAfee, Ed and Andrea Fleming, John and Lori Flaxman, and PWC. So all of them are new stars on the wall, so thank you. Okay, so a lot of you have probably been in this room before, and you know that it looks quite different than it does right now. And uh, the reason it looks so transformed is because the RAF staff has spent a bunch of days turning it into what it is now. And I want to acknowledge them for such an amazing effort. Uh, and in particular, call out um, Natalie, who's really been leading this effort. So thank you.
I'm going to say a couple of words of why I'm here. Like, why is Raft important to me? Uh, why did I uh, want to be here tonight in particular and, you know, be part of this organization? Um, and also share a few thoughts about maybe what's ahead. Um, I joined Raft at a very interesting and exciting time. Uh, after 20 years of service and growth and the leadership of one incredible person. Um, and Mary Simon, the founder uh, and leader for the past 20 years, is also here tonight. So hopefully you'll have a chance to meet with her if you haven't. Uh, but let's give her a round as well. And it can be a little intimidating following in the uh, footsteps of a, uh, such an accomplished leader and someone who's basically built an organization from the ground up to make it what it is today. And uh, I'm pretty honored and flattered uh, to be given that opportunity. Um, it was clear from the start to me what makes this place special. And you know, one of the things that really struck me from the very beginning was that the uh, board of directors and the staff uh, openly and warmly welcomed me and encouraged me. Um, and I know that, uh, as I said, you know, there's been a lot that's been achieved and accomplished here. And to, to kind of take over an organization after 20 years with one leader uh, can be hard. And I think the board has really embraced and supported, and I feel very, very touched by that. Um, I, I, I love uh, the simplicity of our purpose, um, making learning interesting and applicable uh, through hands-on activity. Learning by doing. Turning abstract ideas uh, into concrete understanding. Isn't that how we all learn? Think about your jobs, or parenting, or of course teaching. Experience by doing is how we do learn things. This was applicable when RAF started and it's applicable today, regardless of what's in vogue or not in vogue in terms of the education world. And let me tell you, what's in vogue tends to shift a lot. I mean, let's think quickly. In Raf's lifetime, there was a period in the 90s when there was this thing called project-based learning. Do you guys remember that? And that was actually something very applicable for Raft. It was something that was right in the wheelhouse. Then in the 2000s, you had what was called a, you know, test based accountability, the no child left behind uh, kind of era. That was not such a sweet spot for Raft. <laughs> but now the new standards uh, have put things back in vogue in terms of what we do. Um, it's great. It's great that Raft is in the spotlight again. But I think it's more important that we recognize that the methods are the right methods and that they can withstand the test of time. So whether you are a teacher or a policy wonk or a parent or just a concerned person out in the community, uh, RAFT plays an important role today. We are an essential piece of the education puzzle, even more so with the advent of the new standards and our focus on uh, STEM subjects and 21st century skills. But I want to emphasize that it isn't about hands-on versus something else. It's not hands-on versus new technology, or hands-on versus online, or other kinds of learning. It's hands-on plus. Together, we're stronger. And I think we need to think about that. So what's ahead? To answer, let's think quickly about RAF when, you know, when it started now, and a little picture of what I think is going to be the future. You know, it started out as a fun and creative place. That's what Mary Simon had in mind, a place where teachers could uh, come up with creative ideas and have materials to work with and, uh, you know, have idea sheets and come up with creative kits. You know, there were a lot of fun and exciting things. Uh, there were workshops. They weren't really tied to standards or curricula, but there was a lot of interesting stuff happening. And we had two locations, one in Sunnyvale and one here. Today, that you know, continues, except, you know, we've kind of added uh, some, some refinement. Uh, we have really tailored workshops now uh, that align to the new standards. And we have ideas and kits that cover the new standards. And we have expanded locations. We have a uh, satellite office in Redwood City. We have a uh, affiliate in Sacramento. I mean, yeah, in Sacramento and a, an affiliate in Denver. And let's not forget, we also have an online presence. This is important. So where does that lead us? I say, looking forward, we have to think about things in very strategic ways. 
uh, we need to deepen the practice that we've started. This is essentially our IP. This is what we own. And we need to make sure the program reflects the needs of our, uh, the changing needs of our members. We need to really expand the marketplace after school, summer, national partners, in addition to our traditional partners of schools and teachers. And I believe we actively need to promote STEM to uh, girls and students of color. We need to, of course, scale strategically. For me, it's about measured growth. It's about light overhead, heavy impact. Light overhead, heavy impact. And we need to work even closer with our corporate partners. Many of you in this room are our corporate partners, and we know that we can help you advance your mission as you help us advance ours. And last but not least, I think we need to boost that online presence that we started. There's a lot of, of, of interest and need out there, and it's not just going to be restricted geographically. In closing, RAF will continue to stay the course. We're going to keep that North Star that's been there, that's always been there. And we're going to adjust to the changing educational needs of today and tomorrow. We will honor the past and be forward thinking. That's the key. That's why we've been here for 20 years and why we plan to be here for many more. Thanks for indulging me. So I now want to introduce uh, a very special person um, uh, who is the, year, the winner of this year's Robert Brownlee Award, which is something we present every year for the last six years at least um, to honor an outstanding uh, hands-on science teacher. You will see a short video about this year's winner, uh, Maricela Ruiz Gutierrez, then hear a few words from her. Uh, please, at this time, draw your attention to the screens. I lived in the Central Valley and worked with my parents and my siblings in the fields picking fruit and tomatoes in the summer. There, were, there is nothing glamorous or idyllic about getting up at 3.30 in the morning and working in 103 degree weather. However, it did wonders to galvanize my and my siblings' resolve to go to college. We were looking for an opportunity to achieve our dreams. I have five siblings. All six of us attended and graduated from universities around the state. My name is Maricela Cruz Gutierrez. I was a city planner by training and I am a teacher by choice. I chose to become a teacher for a number of reasons. First, I sought to make this a better world for children to grow up in. I aspired to teach the way I wanted my own children to be taught. Ultimately, I felt I had the responsibility to pay it forward and give my students an opportunity to improve their lives and those of their families. Also wanted to open children's minds to the possibilities available to them if they dare to work hard and dream big. Last March, my classroom's experiment on catapults was awarded the Sweepstakes Award at the San Joaquin County Science Fair. RAF, RAF's ideas and materials made it possible. My students love science and science experiments thanks to RAF. Ms. Ruiz Gutierrez is such a great teacher and a great person, isn't she, Will? Yes, Grace, amazing, always enthusiastic about what we're doing, even if it isn't the most fun thing in the world. Ah, but she made it awesome. She did indeed, from doing no science experiments each and every time to doing kid-friendly multiplication rap songs. We could have written a five-page essay and still had fun, but we had even more fun doing science experiments. We were running out of time, but we want to mention one more thing. She should have gotten this award a long time ago, but better late than never.
And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Maricela. Usually I'm in the other side sitting down watching people get awards, so this is um, humbling and incredible. Thank you to the Robert Brownlee Foundation and the Selection Committee for finding me worthy of such honor. Um, thank you to the corporate owners, uh, donors, the foundations, and the individuals who generously give um, to make places like RAF exist for the betterment of hands-on learning and, in particular, science learning. Getting an award is for having fun and doing my job is amazing. Um, I want to thank Raft, in particular, um, for giving us a, a place Um, for their, their welcoming staff who treat us like professionals and friends. It's an enorm enormous honor for me to be here and to accept the award in the name of all the dedicated, hardworking fellow teachers who quietly go about making this a better world for children to grow up. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, up soon you will hear from our keynote speaker and participate and compete in an activity. I know all of you are type A's, so it's gonna be no problem. Uh, but first, you have some time to enjoy your dinner. Talk to you soon. HP, Table 15, and John Flaxman for getting everyone's attention. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your dinner. We're going to move the program along. I'd like to um, welcome Granger Marburg back up to the podium and also to recognize Kansen Chu and invite Kansen Chu, our uh, councilman from um, District 4. So would you please come join me on the podium? So much. Okay. All right. Great. Um, again, my name is Kansen Chu. I'm a San Jose City Council member representing this area. But before I got elected to this uh, San Jose City Council, I was uh, served as a board member of various uh, union school district. So that's when I first uh, get introduced to the the RAF and all the wonderful uh, job or the impact that you made to many many of our students. As an engineer by training, um, I really, really cannot it just, I, I, I don't know how to describe this, uh, well, what you're doing here uh, c can make an impact to, to many, many of our, our students. So tonight I'm very, very happy to be here uh, on behalf of the city of San Jose uh, to present you a commendation and uh, congratulate you for the uh, 30th birthday. And I wish you have many, many more good years to come. I'm hoping that I will come back here again with my tie and suit uh, as your assembly member representing this area. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
picture for photography? Oh, yeah. No, we got it. Is there a photographer in the house? Okay. Did you get it? Did you get it? You got it. Good. Okay. You got it. Thank you. Good. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, now it's my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, often a keynote is an hour. We have given our keynote speaker 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> it's a short time, but it's a very important message delivered by uh, a stunning star of an educator. Ramsey Masala is a, a secondary science instructor at Sacred Heart Cathedral in San Francisco. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of San Francisco and Toro University. And he's the director of inquiry and innovation at Sacred Heart Cathedral. And he runs intervention, invention workshops for elementary and middle school students throughout the Bay Area. Ramsey delivers keynotes, webinars, and facilitates workshops for teachers nationally and internationally with a focus on using technology as a strategic classroom partner in designing learning environments grounded in inquiry fueled by student curiosity. He's also the host of something called The Infinite Thinking Machine, uh, an internet TV show dedicated to sharing innovative, innovative ideas for teachers, and Ramsey's TED Talk, uh, Three Rules to Spark Learning, is widely popular with classroom teachers um, and was the lead talk on Ted's first ever PBS TV premiere, Ted Talks Education. So would you please put your hands together and welcome Ramsey Musal. Thank you. All right, so uh, thank you very much for having me everybody. In education, uh, I was just having a conversation about Common Core. We have this tendency to assess everything. Um, you know, and uh, so I'm going to start off with a quiz with you guys. So I taught all day today, and I don't know if all the wine in your bellies is going to help you in this quiz or not. Um, so we're going to start off. I'm going to show you five images, and I want you guys to just chatter with the people at your table about the similarities you see between these images. Got it? All right. So here's the first image. <laughs> All right. There were a lot to choose from. This one was just so cute. I, I had to take the black and white Yoda picture. All right, so see the first one? Haymitch and Katniss, for all of those that don't hang out with 15-year-olds all day long. All right. Sean and Will. One of those powerful moments, probably in movie history. Lionel. And Miyagi and Daniel son. All right, so I'm going to put them all together. If you guys could chat with people at your tables, why don't you get 30 seconds? What are some similarities you see between these pictures? All right, who wants to tell me? What smarty pants out there wants to tell me? All right, that's that. We have the, what table is that? OK, uh, the rowdy table nine over there. All right, what do you guys think? What? Coaches? M mentors. No one's getting it. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> Teachers? Sort of close, but not really. Relationships, sort of. All right, you want to know the answer? All right. OK. All of these people, all of the, all of the scenes that you saw there, whether it's Yoda helping uh, whatever he's doing right there with Luke, you know, Will and Sean having their very intense moment in Good Will Hunting, OK, if anybody is obsessed with this movie like me. Um, you know, we all know what, what the king is saying right now, right? <laughs> that moment right there, these, these moments of coaching, um, the famous scenes in Karate Kid, all of these moments happen, okay, 
within, they don't occur until at least 30 minutes into the movie. So all of these scenes where these coaches, these mentors, these teachers are delivering, okay, watch out, education jargon coming now, lower Bloom's taxonomy type information <laughs> to them, it happens within 30 minutes into the movie. It's not the first thing, okay? It's happening later, okay? So what we've seen here is really these things are just all modeling a hero's journey, okay? So I know it's kind of a corny analogy, but what's really interesting about the hero's journey is when the helper shows up, okay? The helper in the hero's journey shows up later. Imagine how ridiculous Star Wars would have been if the first thing was like little Yoda sitting right there, you know, waiting. Or Miyagi just saying, here's your paintbrush, bro, you know? It shows up later when there's a need for the helper, when the helper can respond to that hero's misconceptions about the world. And that hero, whether it's Daniel's son or Will saying, I got to go see about a girl, doesn't just learn something. That person's transformed. It usually turns out, and we can tell here in the famous ending, right? Did he ever explicitly teach Daniel this move? No, right? He just watched him off on that log or whatever, you know, doing it. And he implied it. We got to watch the ending, right? Because it's really inspiring. <laughs> I know you want me to show you Elizabeth Shue running out. I know, trust me. Okay, but what I love about this is it's a perfect metaphor, right? It's a perfect metaphor for what we as educators are trying to do. We want people that are going to create their own reality. We don't want someone who's just going to apply those basic skills, right? Daniel had a time to feel a need for those basic skills. The skills were delivered, and then he applied them and took them to a new level. It was really a, a modeling of the hero's journey. I love this quote from uh, the late David Foster Wallace. Great short stories and great jokes have a lot in common. Both depend on a certain quantity of vital information removed, but evoked by a communication in such a way as to cause a kind of explosion of associative connections within the recipient. That that's what we want our classrooms to look like, an explosion of associative connections. Ironically, Wallace tells us that that comes from the removal of information, from withholding that information. J.J. Abrams says that the withholding of information is what makes movies and books so engaging. We can bring that stuff to the classroom. So it's this paradigm shift in terms of how we view ourselves as teachers. You know, are we a medium of information transfer, or are we someone that's going to facilitate a hero's journey? I mean, I'm teaching intermolecular forces next week. That can be a hero's journey. Where is my role as the mentor? Am I going to be the first thing they experience, or am I going to come in in response to that? It's a very simple message, but it's something that we often don't think about. It's critically important as we move towards Common Core, next-gen science standards, and all these new things in science. So I want to tell you a brief story to end um, as a time when I really had an aha moment as a teacher. So this is a typical, typical thing I would do as a teacher, um, flip the classroom. So my students are watching a video for homework on how to balance combustion reactions. Um, I'm doing it really, it's a really good job. I'm proud of this video, you know. So a lot of uh, graduate school money went into doing this, and, and they're watching it, and, they're, and, and they come to class, and they can balance a combustion reaction perfectly. They know exactly what to do. And then we come into class, and we do the typical lab teachers will do after combustion reactions. You know, here's a bunch of candles. What's going to happen when you put the jar on the candle? The candle's going to go out, right? And I'm feeling like, you know, a modern-day Arab Jaime Escalante at this point, you know? <laughs> like, I'm just, like, amazing. And, you know, why does it go out? It runs out of oxygen, obviously. But that was the big thing they had to figure out in the lab. You know, why does it go out? Because it runs out of oxygen, you know? And I, would, I told them this. It was an obvious observation. I felt it. It was amazing. And then there was this voice in the back of the classroom. Kevin Blank, I won't say his name, because there's a camera right there, and he's a freshman at Berkeley. I see you, Kevin, okay? And he just said this. He said, I don't believe you. He literally stood up, and suddenly this 5'3 kid is like 6'12, standing there looking down on me, and I feel like a complete imposter, which if there's any teachers here, the imposter complex is real. We know that we feel that a lot, okay? 
So I'm, going, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, do I, do I say I'm going to send you an email and we can talk about it later? Or do I BS something about my pr teacher at Davis and he said, oh, it's the oxygen. It's a complex phenomenon. But, and he just said, I don't believe you. And it was the first time I've been challenged on this thing that I accepted so clearly. I mean, obviously, it's the oxygen. 100% of you would have said the oxygen, too, I bet. OK? So I don't know what happened. I think it, this is the moment when I felt like I became a real teacher. Instead of coming up with some BS response, I don't know where it came from inside of me, but all I said to him was, prove it. Just That was it. Just prove it. And the moment I said that, he shrunk back down to 5'3". And he looked really excited, right? And he, he pulled me over to his table and said, well, check this out. You get, and this is the exact video he took. He's like, you guys, you gave us a bunch of candles and some stoppers. Um, and instead of putting them in different jars, I just put one higher than the other in the same jar. Right? And he goes, look what happened. Yeah, I'm ready. That's the first thing that everybody thinks that the candles yeah, but it's not. It's okay. So he did that, and he's like, listen, the top one went out before the bottom one. So obviously, there's still oxygen in there. I think what's putting out this candle is just more complex than that. And I was like, prove it. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm on a roll. Why did I pay for my doctor at 60K down the toilet? I just should have said prove it the whole time. Right? So I'm just going through this. And he's like, comes back with this. So simple, right? You know, I don't even know if this, and, and then after this, he says, I think it's the carbon dioxide that's putting it out. I think it's putting itself out with its own carbon dioxide. And then the bell rang, right? And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I called my dad. I watched Apollo 13 because I was like, well, there's a scene where they're running out of, oh, it's the carbon dioxide. <laughs> and I went back and went to the YouTube and figured out that I should have known my science if I put a little mouse in there, forget the biologist that did it, the mouse would still be alive. Like, there's a ton of oxygen in there that its own carbon dioxide that's putting out, that this thing that I had my own misconception on as a teacher was actually a complex phenomenon that had to do with not only convection currents, but gas density, okay, and, uh, and diffusion, and Graham's law, and Le Chatelet's principle, and all this stuff that's beautiful that I had, I had not thought about. Well, we came back the next day, and I, as a teacher, had to deliver all that, right? But it came from a place where they knew that I didn't know that right away. But those two days, literally, best two teaching days ever. I am closer with those kids after that moment, and the class just changed from that moment. Okay, and this is that idea. The, the withholding of information, even from myself, was a good thing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so kind of interesting. So here is you know, Maddie Lee, uh, uh, one, a student that graduated in, I think, 2010. Um, only picture I could pull off Facebook where I had a whole body shot of a kid. Um, and I think to myself, you know, was I the medium of information transfer for Maddie, or you know, was, that is some really bad keynote effects, by the way, right? <laughs> was, um, was I sending Maddie on a hero's journey? What does that mean? To me, that just means, was my role later in the process? Did I respond to her misconceptions, or did I just assume that she and everyone else knew, how, knew what they needed to balance a combustion reaction, right? Because now, it's like the point is to get kids to say, I don't believe you. So it's, it's an interesting time. So... What is your hero's journey? Well, we're going to send you on a hero's journey. Your hero's journey is going to be projectile motion. Are you ready? All right, I'm going to bring Patty up right now, and she's going to help facilitate our hero's journey for you right now. Um, and she's on her way. And this is probably what you guys have been waiting for all night. <laughs> OK. All right, so you set up. OK. So I'm going to set the stage for you right now. I need you to listen up closely. And by the way, I do not do workshops on classroom management, OK? <laughs> so be, be easy on me here. OK. So the year is 2044. It's in the future. The 20th Annual International Catapult Challenge 
to be held in San Jose, California is coming up soon. All right? It's a big deal. Okay. Like with fencing and archery, formerly necessary survival skills, we saw Katniss up there, <laughs> we see new sports like catapult competitions capture the imagination and interest of a worldwide audience. Okay? So the mayor of San Jose has, spot, has sponsored a catapult innovation contest challenging the citizens, all of you, to design a model of a catapult that could be replicated on large scale that can be crowned the winner for accuracy and efficiency. So our goal tonight is to come up with a winning model that will ensure return of the World Cup in this competitive sport back to the USA. Mm -hmm. To achieve this goal, we have gathered the best and brightest minds. That's all of you, obviously. <laughs> okay. Um, your table mates are your working te teammates. Patty will, Patty will go over the ground rules with oh. you right now, so let's see it. Okay, let me tell them what our goal is. As a team here, you're going to be launching some ammunition, and there are going to be some pom-poms, and the goal is to get 20. So I'm gonna have our RAF staff members get up now and go to the back of the room, and you're gonna be delivered this red bag. Each table will have one red bag. Inside this red bag is everything you need to build two catapults. You don't have to build two, but you can build two. It all depends upon your own design. We're hoping each one will be unique. Now, some of the important rules, you can only use the items in this red bag, except we do not want you to use this little orange flag. It has a special purpose, so save it for later. <laughs> Also, you may not uh, move the centerpiece. You can use it while you're practicing, but it's going to have to be in the middle. And your catapult must be shot from the base. Um, you can't be just taking the spoons and, and moving them around. And you'll understand that a little bit more as your red bag is delivered. Please don't open your red bag yet. Please. <laughs> OK. The first thing that you're going to need to do, when I tell you not yet, this is your target where the pom-pom ammo is going to go. After you do your design, you're going to have to practice and test your prototype. There's a little piece of tape on the back. I want you to pull that off. You can see our picture right there. Put that on the center of your, the top of your centerpiece. And that's what's going to be your target. So that's the first thing you're going to want to do because as you practice with your prototype, you're going to want to be, um, make sure that you have a target. <laughs> All right, we're going to give you, there's two, there's two phases. We're going to give you seven minutes to go ahead and design and build and test. Then we're going to stop. And the second phase will begin, and it's going to be a launching competition, and there will be a winner. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so. Let's go. Everyone look at the timer. One, two, three, go. Five-minute mark. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two minutes left, we're going to sell. Now, Whoa. In, five, in five minutes. Okay. What are you doing, table nine? Okay. 
All right, stop right. Why not? All right, warning. Go. Go ahead. Five minute warning. We have a hint on the board. Take a look up here. Quick look. We've. This is a design that one of our raft engineers, Mike Pollock, came up with. Now, you can create your own, but I just want you to go ahead and take a quick look if someone wants to run up and take a quick. It's only going to be here for about 10 seconds, but this is a Nine, great design. Eight, <laughs> seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> take it away. <laughs> You're enabling our audience. <laughs> Let's get the timer back. <laughs> Good. Two-minute mark, we're selling extra okay. spoons. Apron. So how do we do um, RAF staff members have glow sticks on their wrists. Say, yeah, yeah, you have, and you have one, you have two minutes to buy them. Twenty dollars a spoon, cash only. <laughs> Some of them are looking up on their iPhone how to build a catapult. I love it. <laughs> I know, it's great. Use, use that technology. If you notice around you, you'll see a wrap, a wrap member with a glowing bracelet, bracelet. and an apron. Anybody want to buy another spoon? Twenty dollars. You're going to find that very you can do handy. As many as you want. Think of how many more you can launch during the launching phase. So there's some wrap staff members walking around. Twenty dollar donation. It's for the kids, you guys. <laughs> You might want some extra spoons. You can have as many spoons as you want. 20 or 10 for 200. <laughs> there you go. Or 10 for 200. Absolutely. <laughs> RAF members, put up your hand. These are going to come in very handy later. You're going to wish you had some. <laughs> You're only going to have three minutes to get them in. <laughs> Okay, you only have one minute left to test and build your design. One minute left to buy some spoons. That one's pretty good. I think it's great. What's that? Okay. Got about 30 seconds left to test. Time for countdown. Yeah. 20 seconds remaining. Nine. Nine. 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Design time is over. <laughs> okay, everyone, stop designing, please. All right. Let's everyone have a seat for a moment. <laughs> okay, can everyone find their orange flag for me? All right, whoever is holding the orange flag at your table is now your counter. Okay. <laughs> The first thing you have to do is take all your pom-poms out of the silver tray. We're starting with zero. The tray must be empty. Okay, another important rule. When you're doing your catapult, if it bounces in and then goes out, it doesn't count. I know that happened, sorry. It's got to go in and stay in in order for it to count. So our goal is 20 as a table. We're going to start the music, and the first table that successfully gets 20 in, I need my counter to stand up and yell and scream and tell me that they made 20, and then we'll have a winner, OK? OK, so we're going to go ahead and put three minutes on the clock, and we'll count down to start time. Can you start us off, Ramsey? It's up. Start us off. Okay, everybody. On your marks. Get set. How's your men? Go. <laughs> That's a great design. I love it. Well. You tell them we have a winner. We have to put y'all in here. We have a winner. We have a winner. Rumor has it someone's at 17 already. Oh, we have a winner! I think we have a winner. We have a winner. Oh. And it's not table nine. What table is it over here? What is it? Morgan Stanley 15. Morgan Stanley 15. Woo! I got my home alone through Morgan Stanley. True story. Where you at? <laughs> okay. Uh, and look at this wonderful trophy they're going to get. Oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> and then you can do You'll do reflection. What? You're going to do the reflection? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, guys, some points of reflection for this. Um, a couple things that, that I couldn't help noticing as a teacher are all the wonderful things that now I have a window to teach through. I, could have, I can now go off on a direction about torque. We can now talk about uh, projectile motion and get into some deep physics, or we could actually talk about design. 
Either way, whatever I now decide to lecture to you about, you feel a greater need for. That's that delayed mentor on that hero's journey. If you notice, we dropped in some hints. They came later. They didn't come first. We would have completely stifled you if they came first. So just some things to reflect on, all right? When, as, when can we as teachers find our sweet spot to jump in and harness that process? Okay? It doesn't mean that we can't be the bearers of content. It just means that we need to wait a little bit. So you guys enjoy that activity? Okay, let's give a hand to the Morgan Stanley team one more time. Okay, please just uh, take the materials, put them back in the red bag, and feel free to take home your catapults this evening. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, everybody. We have, somewhat sadly, come to the end of tonight's performance <laughs> engagement. Uh, I think one of the things that is very clear to me is there's a huge difference. I've been to a lot of events like this, not like this, but like you know, general benefit, of, you know, events, and. Um, this is definitely very different. Uh, I'm glad I'm here tonight, and I'm glad, again, to be part of this. So thank you for engaging. Uh, thank you for uh, all kind of rolling up your sleeves and competing with this, figuring it out. Um, I'm going to close with uh, an ask. I have an ask. This is the main benefit for us in the year. As you know, all of you have been very generous in terms of being here. A lot of sponsors have spent money to make this happen, and we appreciate that. Thank you. I want to make sure, though, that you have an opportunity to give. There are envelopes on the table. Please take one. Please consider participating in our Fund for the Future campaign. A few long-time supporters of RAFT, some of whom are actually in this room tonight, have put together a challenge grant of $250,000 to honor Mary Simon and celebrate our 20 years of service. Every new, renewed, and increased gift we get will be matched one for one. Now, simple math, 100 becomes 200, 1,000 becomes 2,000, 20,000, what's that? <laughs> Since this uh, generous gift was announced in March, uh, we have actually raised a little over 200,000 already, and we want to close this. So I really, really, really <laughs> am asking you to join us Help us close this gap. We have about 50,000 left of this challenge. It's matched one to one. I know you've been generous. You're here. Thank you. And I hope you consider joining this challenge and helping us reach our goal. I will give you a few minutes to fill out your forms. And if you want to pay via credit card right now, we actually have, OK, over there, uh, let me see. OK, Vanessa, there you are. OK. With the um, hand waving, she's got a, uh, I think, an iPad that she can actually run your card right now. So if you want to do that, uh, do it that way, that's fine. We also have a couple bowls on the way out that if you fill something out in your envelope, just drop it in the bowl. That would be great. So I'll give you a couple minutes, and then we are going to close. Our promise to you is to get you out at 8, and we're going to do that. So thank you. Have a two minutes, and we'll close up. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this is now the very end of our show. I really appreciate any consideration and your participation here tonight. 
And I want to say, if you don't do it for us, do it for my 10-year-old son, Oliver, and my 13-year-old son over there, Leo, because they're the ones who benefit from this, too. So thank you. <laughs> take, take care. <laughs>